Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Growth and Resiliency Speaker Series. This is number seven. This is the seventh speaker in the series and actually happens to be the final speaker in this particular series. So we're delighted to have Max Valiket with us today, and I will shortly provide an introduction to who Max is um, before I've provided a, an introduction to the Growth and Resiliency Speaker Series. So this speaker series is being beamed across the province, in fact, beamed globally to all of you currently online. And it really focuses on the growth and performance of small and medium organizations that have been particularly challenged during this time of COVID. And so it's all about that resilience and recovery process. And we're delighted to be having the support of Mount Royal University in, in partnership with their Growth Catalyst program, as well as Alberta Innovates, which is the province's innovation engine and a key innovation ecosystem support organization. A number of you will know Alberta Innovates that are on the call today. But let's get to our keynote today. Super excited to introduce Max Valica. He's an innovation, transformation, and marketing expert. Um, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, nonetheless, called him a can't-miss public speaker. And marketing, manage, um, marketing magazine named him as one of the most influential marketers in Canada. Uh, Max is a multi-award winner, marketer, and consultant, known for transforming businesses and brands by focusing on what's now and what's next. Um, Max is the founder of Youthography, a groundbreaking marketing company that was first in North America to focus exclusively on millennials, a huge market out there. He is currently the chief strategy officer at Diamond Integrated Marketing. And from Google to Microsoft, from Ford to Jeep, from Puma to Nike, from Scotiabank to Citibank, Max has worked with the biggest brands in the world and is never happier than when he gets to the, the channel to uh, share his experience um, into a transformative presentation for a live audience. So please welcome Max Valiket. So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. It's, um, it's great, actually, to be here. Uh, so, uh, and thank you very much, Simon, for the introduction. Today, I'm going to be talking to everyone here about uh, growth through brand and purpose. This is called Building an Identity You Can Rally Around. And just a quick couple of bits of housekeeping before we start. Uh, one is there is a question and answer functionality that I'm sure you're all aware of. I know some people say keep questions until the end. I would prefer that you don't. So please feel free to ask questions. They'll be pushed to me by the folks running this conference today, and I'm able to answer them in the moment. I'd prefer to deal with your questions while they're burning with you than I would uh, uh, prefer to sort of wait un until the end for everything. That being said, we um, are limited to an hour. So if we don't get to your question or I push things along, don't take it personally. That's just me wanting to get through the entirety of the presentation. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's very nice to be here. Uh, I guess we're now getting into, uh, into year two of uh, making presentations like this. So hopefully we're all acclimatized, but not so acclimatized that uh, we're not ready to spring back uh, as things hopefully start to change. Um, as was mentioned, I'm the CSO of Diamond. We are one of Canada's largest independent advertising agencies. But I'm going to talk a little bit about me and my brand first and foremost. Uh, Marketing Magazine, as was mentioned, called me one of Canada's most influential marketers. And um, depending on your, your mileage with the prime minister, you may uh, be more or less well disposed to hearing uh, that he called me a can't miss speaker. But specifically, I'm just bringing this up again, even after that wonderful introduction, because we're going to be talking about brands. We're going to be talking about brands and branding. We're going to be talking about brands and branding for personal businesses, for startups, and for scale-ups and businesses at very different stages of their life cycle. And we're going to talk about personal brands and the way that we have an impact on the brands of our businesses as well um, over the course of this presentation. So I'm bringing me up right now before we, we talk in a little more detail, and it will make, make sense in a few seconds. But that's the big thing that I want to talk about today, is that we're going to be talking about big brands and small brands and back again. And so when I teach brand and branding specifically for growth, I like to talk about big, huge brands of which we are all aware, even if we're, our businesses quite aren't at that stage yet. The Coca-Colas and Nikes and Starbucks and Ubers of the world have lessons for all of us, and those are the ones we're going to be learning from today. So it's from biggies to smalls and back again. All right, so we've got a couple of seconds to come through, but the first one here today is going to be talking about personal brands which I refer to as being the ultimate startup or scale-up brand. 
And I mentioned that for a couple of reasons. I speak about personal brands this way for a couple of very important reasons, but the most important reason is that whatever business you represent, if you started the business yourself or got in there at a very early stage, your personal brand, in fact, your person is probably quite connected to that business. Personal brands and startup scale up business brands are not exactly the same thing, but an entrepreneur's personal brand will also give to and get from the brand of the business they are most or most currently associated with. There are a few hundred people on this call, I think, and you're going to represent businesses of all different sizes. And so before we talk about your business's brand in particular, I want to talk about your brand in particular and how that has an impact on your business. As was mentioned, I started out in this industry probably about 25 years ago, but my first real foray into working for myself and doing something new and different, starting my own business, was a business called Youthography, which was the first of its kind in North America, a marketing and research company focused exclusively on the youth demographic, which at the time was something really different and special. This was the year 1999 or 2000, and we hadn't even coined the term millennials yet, but my organization was researching millennials, understanding millennials, and marketing to them. I got very closely associated with this demographic, where I would make speeches and I would present to all sorts of people across the country. I did, in fact, present uh, everywhere from the uh, legislature in Ontario to a huge group of uh, civil servants in in Canada about how to get in uh, Ottawa. Sorry, about how to get young people more involved in voting. To uh, literally every one of the, the biggest consumer facing youth brands across Canada and, in fact, across the United States. And that's what I became associated with. But there's nothing like turning 40 to have it be kind of creepy that you're known as a youth expert. So in fact, I actually found that I had to do a bit of pivoting in my own personal brand, and this was a good thing. So I was able to transition from being all about youth to being about innovation, technology, uh, marketing, brand purpose, the things you're going to hear some about today, and make that transition and build from that business into my personal brand, which has then followed me in anything else that I do, including now being CSO at Diamond, which is one of the largest independent ad agencies in Canada that has a much larger focus than just young people. So your personal brand and your startup or scale-up brands are related, and I believe now more than ever. If you're a business of one or leading a business of some, understanding what your personal brand brings to your business and takes from your business is important. But I will say this, the most important thing is building a brand for your business that is bigger than you. Speaking very candidly, I had a lot of success at youthography, but I think the mistake that I made was I had too much of an association between me and my personal brand and the business itself. And it did not survive our transition plans of me handing it over to someone else or to a group of people as it were, because um, I wasn't there anymore, I think. And I hadn't done a good enough job of understanding what my brand was and what my business's brand was and making sure that they weren't the same thing as a part of our succession plan. So if you've started a business and you're a very small group, if you're even a business of one, I want you to think a little bit about your personal brand, but pivot very quickly now and think more about the brand that you are creating for your business that you may have been a, a, a foundational part of starting it, but needs necessarily to be bigger than you. So let's start talking about brands. Here's our first section, which is what is a brand? And I mean, you've got options in the Q&A here, so please feel free, but does anyone actually feel like just typing in what you think a brand is? I don't mean the names of some popular brands, but uh, does anyone just for the, uh, the great recognition I'm gonna bring to them in front of a group of their peers feel like bringing a definition of what they think a brand is? You can put that in the Q&A or put that in chat somewhere if you'd like to. This is a tough one, and sometimes I get people who want to lift up their hand and go, a brand is something. A brand is a symbol. A brand is a logo. Some people will say a brand is the way you express what you do. I think we can use this guy's description of what a brand is. This is Seth Godin, and he's a great thinker uh, about marketing. And he says, a brand is the set of expectations, memories, stories, and relationships that, taken together, account for a consumer's decision to choose one product or service over another. If the consumer, whether it's a business, a buyer, a voter, or a donor, doesn't pay a premium, make a selection, or spread the word, then no brand value exists for the consumer. I put it in a slightly shorter way, which is to say a brand is a promise of value that has value. 
It is a promise to deliver functional benefits and affinity benefits to all of your stakeholders. And when you do it right, it leads to disproportionate loyalty, which creates value. Your brand is the way that you promise your customers that they're going to get something from your business. And if you do that well and right and often enough and build your brand up correctly, your brand has value as does your business have value. I'm gonna use a couple of examples, but what I wanna show is that this has actually been the case for as long as there has been commerce. This is from Pompeii, somewhere obviously before 79 AD when the entire country, uh, uh, city sorry, was covered in the ash of a volcano. And as much as that's a, an enormous historical tragedy, we can point back to Pompeii when we're looking at things historically because so much of the town was preserved by that volcanic eruption. Pompeians loved to write on the walls of their houses. And we know this because those walls have actually been preserved. The writing on those walls actually turned into advertising, recommendations on where to get the best bread or the best wine or the cheapest meat. Ads were written on the walls of houses advertising where to buy things. But the more expensive the house, the more wealthy the homeowner, the more they would charge you for putting your advertisement on their wall because there was an implication of an endorsement that this must be a good recommendation being made on the walls of that house. Look how expensive that house is. Well, that belongs to Caecilius. He's rich. Anything he allows on his walls is probably better than something someone else is allowing on their walls. That's advertising as we know it. That's influencer marketing as we know it. That's buying for a media placement. That's guerrilla marketing even as we know it, but 2,000 years ago. So that's a good example of how a brand matters and how important brands have been ever since we've had business. I can go to an example that's a little more recent, and I think some of you may well uh, recognize this symbol. This is Bass Pale Ale. And often when we think about brands, we tend to think about a logo. A brand is so much more than a logo, but it's a good example of how much brands matter. Bass is a delightful beer. It's made in Burton-on-Trent in England. That's about two hours outside of London. And by it was started in, in 1777, and by 1877, Bass was the biggest brewery in the world. The Red Triangle was first stamped on barrels to identify what brewery it came from. There was a yellow one, and there was a blue one, and there was a red one, and Bass actually had three separate uh, breweries going. Generally, it was considered that the red ale was actually the best tasting ale, and so it is the one that people demanded more of, and so you started seeing more and more of these red triangles. The beer was really good, and stamping that triangle with that logo on it became the promise of quality. Again, a brand is a promise of value that has value. This is actually the first trademark symbol in at least the United Kingdom, but perhaps all of Europe, where the very smart people working on bass in the 19th century realized that they shouldn't just be trademarking the beer in the barrels or the process that it takes to get there. They shouldn't own a patent just on that. They need, in fact, to own this symbol so that it can't be misused and that people will know that you get a barrel or a bottle with a red triangle on it, you know what the liquid inside is going to be. This, in fact, became such a profoundly well-understood symbol of quality that it started popping up everywhere. This is uh, the bar at the Funny Met de Berger, is the name of this picture, and it's a painting by Edouard Manette from 1882. And check out the bottom right-hand corner. You can see right there, you've got Bass Pale Ale sticking out, label out. And if he'd wanted to, he could have actually had the bottle facing inwards. But again, this is a significant brand, and he wanted to put in his painting. This is an example of product placement. I don't know if he was paid for it or not, but there it is. The painting changes, the story it's telling changes, and the story we're telling about the brand changes too when we see it in that painting. Heritage and history are a part of Bass, and even now it helps to have this bottle in this painting in some way. And that adds to the value of the business because it adds to the value of the brand. About a decade ago, Interbrew bought Bass Pale Ale uh, and, and uh, amalgamating it into their uh, great stable of beers, and that created the second biggest brewer in the world. But they didn't buy it exclusively for the capacity of the breweries in Burton-on-Trent. They bought it because they could take this symbol, this brand. They could repurpose other breweries all around the world. 
and they could sell more of this beer even without it originating from England. They could brew it in any market they wanted to. And as long as, of course, they got that right, which is very possible these days, they would then be able to put this brand in far more places than it had ever been before. Interbrew has plenty of breweries around the world. They weren't buying this brand for capacity. They were buying this brand for its equity and that they would be able to then grow the business because the brand was even bigger than the beer. So great brands have meaning and great brands last and great brands eventually develop a value of their own. So what is a brand? It's a logo, it's packaging, it's typography, the personality, those all represent the brand along with customer service, price, product, quality, corporate responsibility. But the brand itself is a bit more intangible. It's emotional, it's visual, it's historical, it's fundamentally much more human. So that's a lot about what a brand is. But now we're gonna talk about what brands do. And I'll take a quick pause just to say, please feel free to ask some questions if you would like to. But if not, we will just keep on going. And by the way, I've noticed that there were some answers as to what brands are. Um, Scott said it's uh, the most immediate idea of what the company or person brings to someone's mind. I love that, and we'll talk about positioning soon. Kalina, you said uh, uh, just um, uh, a straightforward identity, which is really interesting. Um, S. Hafiz, Hafiz, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. You said something that people can associate or identify with, which I love. Florent, you said a brand is perception by others. That is very, very true, and we will talk about brand perception soon. Um, and Miranda, you said it's the personality and driving force of a company, which I love. And Karen, you said it's your promise to people. So these are really great things. We'll actually be using that term promise as we go through this next section. So thank you for setting me up, Karen. Okay. So what do brands do? Well, brands make promises and brands need proof. If I were to ask people what the number one kids brand of all time in the world is, we would probably get a few answers. Some of you might say that it's uh, Lego. I hear that sometimes. Some people say Mattel. Personally, I think the number one kids brand of all time is Disney. And Disney has an army of trademark lawyers who are protecting every single part of their brand, right? They're making sure actively that no one takes Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck and unlawfully reproduces them because there's so much equity in the Disney brand, but also in the sub-brands of Disney's characters. So these two guys are as protected as if they were the Bass logo or Coca-Cola or Pepsi or anything else. But the thing is, these brands are so popular with kids that in fact, they have been illegally reproducing these characters, much to the chagrin of Disney's trademark lawyers, and our parents have been aiding and abetting us by posting them on fridges everywhere across the world. That's how powerful these brands are, that we actually recreate them ourselves because we engage with a good brand that powerfully. Now, Disney's brand promise is an interesting one, and you can actually see it at Disney World where literally it says where dreams come true. Now, I said that brands make promises and that brands need proof, and that is an absolutely incredible brand promise for a brand to make, where dreams come true. And Disney does a great job of its marketing and its branding. You can find a great video if you want on the internet, of a, uh, which I can, I can actually send out to the group if you'd like, but it's of a young girl who gets surprised with the trip to Disney World by her parents, and she absolutely just loses her mind. She's so thrilled at being able to go there. But again, she's never been, but she's been told by the great Disney marketing machine that her dreams will come true when she gets there. Disney is actually able to have a where dreams come true promise because they make dreams come true for young people. They do incredibly amazing things at Disney World to make sure that they deliver on that brand promise. They take away pain points and they augment pleasure points, making sure that you can have a tea party with the Disney princess of your choice. Every day when the fireworks go off on Main Street, it's like they're going off for the very first time. But Disney also recognizes that they need to do things like provide fast passes or make sure that if it's raining, they can show up at your car as you open the door to get out with umbrellas for you. They do a great job of managing where people have parked because inevitably people forget where they've parked. And at the end of the day, your kids are coming down from a massive sugar and adrenaline high and they just need to get home. Disney knows that if it takes you an hour and a half to find your car, you will not have had your dreams come true that day. So they do a better job of logging where individual cars are than the car owners do themselves to make sure that you can get out. 
My favorite thing Disney does with their brand is they train all of their employees playing Disney characters to sign the names of those characters with exactly the same signature. So that if your kid goes to Disney World in July and they get um, Elsa to sign something and someone else's kid goes to Disneyland in August and they get Elsa to sign an autograph book, when those two people are comparing Elsa autographs, they're going to be the same to keep that illusion going, which is incredibly important. Disney makes that promise, but they can make that promise based on that proof. And you can actually find another video of the same young lady two years later going back to Disney World, and she has the same insane meltdown when she's about to go back because she had such a great experience. So your brand needs to make a promise, and your brand needs proofs. It's the same for smaller brands. You may not be making a promise of where dreams come true with your business, but you should be making a promise that your business can deliver on. I find that for new businesses, for small businesses, for startups and for scale-ups, it's actually best to go to the great Simon Sinek and start with why. When you are thinking about your brand promise, remember this quote from this gentleman, which is, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So if you're thinking about what your brand promise is, what's going to be at the center of your brand's mission or uh, your brand's purpose, it's going to be built around that why. Great brand, to get an example of this from, is Nike, a, a brand that I imagine everyone here has probably heard of. If, uh, if not, you should look them up. We're all aware of what Nike's big slogan is, and that's just do it. But that's not their brand purpose. That's not their why. Right? This is the consumer-facing expression of that brand purpose. Anyone wants to just put it into the chat, I'm going to ask if anyone is aware of what Nike's brand purpose or Nike's mission is. Again, it's not just do it, but it's a terrifically constructed sentence. And actually, this was Nike's driving mission uh, period for the first 40 or 50 years that the company has actually been in business. They had a very clever sentence as to what their mission was. I'll share it on the next slide, but please feel free to send in. You'll get bonus points, and I'll call out your name and say something nice about you. Nike's mission is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. Now, that's they call it their mission, but it's essentially their purpose. We don't have to get held up with nomenclature here. I'm just going to repeat that, to bring innovation and inspir inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And what I love about Nike is that there's that little asterisk beside ath athlete, if you can see that there. And they say this, if you have a body, you are an athlete. They actually put this on the walls of their offices in Oregon. Nike campus will be emblazoned with this to bring in inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And if you have a body, you are an athlete. Uh, and Florent, you're on fire here. Uh, uh, either you work for Nike or you're just very good at Googling or do you have this tattooed on you somewhere? I don't actually know, but that's exactly right. Bring inspiration, innovation to every athlete in the world. And then they have a, a greater mission, which is about uh, groundbreaking sports innovations, making their products sustainably, all of, uh, all of that kind of stuff. That's very true. The very first Nike ad for Just Do It did not feature Michael Jordan, didn't feature Bo Jackson. It came out in 1988. It actually felt a guy named Walter Stack. And I would recommend anyone Google Walter Stack and Nike, and you'll get this commercial. And essentially, you see an old man who's running across the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And he talks about how he goes running every morning. And then it says Walter Stack, 80 years old, on the screen. And he turns to the camera and he says... People ask me how I keep my teeth from chattering when I run early in the morning. And then he turns to the camera and he goes, I just leave them at home. And then it says, just do it. So when Nike says innovation and inspiration to every athlete, they mean every athlete. And what I absolutely love about that ad is that was the launch ad for Just Do It. It didn't feature some famous, incredible, multi-millionaire athlete who had won championships or been at the pinnacle of their sport. Nike proved their brand purpose and how applicable it would be to everyone by being able to create compelling branding and compelling marketing that didn't feature those guys, that featured someone who was much more in line with one of their more regular customers. I will say that in the time since, 
Nike's actually pivoted a little bit their brand purpose. And so they still talk about this vision of innovation and inspiration, but now they would say their larger purpose is uniting the world through sport. And you can see in their latest branding that they've taken it a step beyond about being just about the innovation and inspiration for athletes, but in fact, this sense of uniting the world and their last big brand ad that featured split screen cutaways of different athletes doing different things, but looking like they were one at the same time was a really good example of that. And they've doubled down on that notion of uniting the world through sport. And Nike's having a really great couple of years right now. And it is in no small part due to how well they've managed to communicate what their brand is about. So why you do is also why you matter to your customers. And a great purpose builds a great brand. That's true for big brands. That's true for smaller brands as well. And so incredibly important for you and for your brand is that you figure out what your purpose is. And I know there's different people in the room who have different levels of growth uh, in their business currently. And what I would say, the single biggest challenge I see for businesses that need to scale up is they haven't truly thought through what that brand purpose is. You may have your corporate mission statement written down on a single uh, page. You may have done your own corporate vision on a single page, but that's not the same as understanding what your brand purpose is. So how do you build your brand? Well, I've got seven big things I'm going to take people through over the course of the rest of the presentation in understanding what you in particular can actually be doing for yourself and for your brand to make sure that your business and your brand start to put some of these uh, best practices of the Nikes and Disney's of the world behind your brand or your business. Just going to pause for a second because we've gone through a fair amount and ask, are there any questions so far on brand purpose, on why, on vision, on mission, or um, anything else anyone would like to bring up? In case people need time to put something in chat, I'll very slowly drink from this enormous white mug. That was delicious. Uh, Karen just asked, having a, this is great. Karen just said, sorry, this is Karen Anderson, who just said, having a clear why helped me drop what we were doing and innovate new ways to fulfill our why during COVID. Um, and Karen, would you mind just putting in the chat what your business is, if that's okay? You don't have to, but if you would, it, what a great example this is. So thank you very much for sharing that because the single biggest things that I noticed for businesses that were able to successfully pivot during COVID was in fact having a great understanding of what their why was. We heard a lot of stories of uh, the alcohol company that made sanitizer, and that's not what I mean by a business pivot. That's uh, a momentary, a, a moment-based pivoting of a business that uses what your resources are and what you're able to do, having lots of alcohol in hand, being able to put it in bottles, send it out there as a way to um, meet a demand that was necessary. But unsurprisingly, the people who actually make sanitizers and wipes and all of those things uh, were eventually able to scale up their own operations and provide uh, better, uh, not necessarily better, but, but uh, provide to more of their customers the, the, the stuff that we needed. That to me is not as much of a, of a, of a COVID pivot as uh, you have a business and you may have an entirely new long-term market, not just something that is relevant for the pandemic, but something that is relevant during COVID and after that allows you to fundamentally pivot your uh, what your business is doing and discover a new market or uh, an existing a, a, a way to get further entrenched with your existing customers or something new that you should be bringing to the table that will outlast uh, uh, something like a, a pandemic for a year. It tends to go back to that why. I noticed actually that there were um, a lot of clothing and apparel brands. Uh, some of whom got very early into uh, masks and protective equipment and that kind of thing, and uh, very much ramped up at the beginning to say, oh, we can do this when supply was very short. I'm noticing that some of the larger clothing brands have actually done a much better job of integrating masks into their regular offerings. And the masks that they're making are increasingly less just about being a functional looking mask and instead looking at something great uh, uh, that matches the general style of clothing. So H&M, uh, um, for instance, does colorful printed masks now that you can buy for a very cheap price that look like the kind of accessory that should be right beside a pair of socks. 
but they understood that their fast fashion consumer and their why is you know to provide uh, innovative and interesting fashion for uh, everyone at great prices uh, that they'd be looking for their masks to actually probably look a little bit interesting and also be not that expensive so it's that kind of brand pivoting that i'm that i'm talking about um, Karen, you mentioned your Alberta food tours. Our why is to increase the health of soil, food, and people. We did that through storytelling, connecting people through experiences we created for people to eat, engage, and explore with in-person tours. And this is great. Now we developed a self-guided food tour game, care package gift boxes filled with Alberta food products. Uh, I'll send you my address, Karen, and virtual breakout room food-oriented activities. So this is great because your why isn't to have people tour Alberta. Your why is to increase the health of soil, food, and people. And I love that. That's a greatly well-defined why, which means that as soon as tours are back on again, you'll be able to do that as soon as that's possible. But I love that your why isn't to provide tours through Alberta, Alberta's um, uh, food industry for as many people as possible. That's an output of that why. The why is to increase the health of soil, food, and people. So I just love it. Uh, Florent, you asked for uh, tips on how to translate vision and mission into strategy and where to start. I'm going to start right now. So many good segues from people asking questions today. I'm very appreciative of this. So let's talk about some actionable things to do with some actionable examples. So if you haven't actually written your why down yet, my step number one is, first of all, to find your why. And very simply, your why is the shared equity between the reason you and your employees come to work and the reason you matter to your best customers. It's very difficult to put how to find your why on a single slide, but this for me has been consistently the best way to do it. You need to figure out why you and your employees show up every day, what it is that matters to you about what you're building, why you love to be there, and then the reason you really matter to your best customers. Those two things put together are probably what your why is all about. So using Karen's example, for instance, of Alberta food tours is an interesting one because that why has a customer-facing element to it, and that why also has an uh, Alberta food tours element of it. So everyone who's engaging wants uh, a, a healthier soil, healthier food, and healthier people. And so you figure that out. And you figure that out by saying, why do we matter to our customers? Well, they leave our food tours feeling like um, they know how to make the soil healthier. They leave our food tours knowing what healthy food is. And most importantly, they leave our food tours uh, knowing about what food means to them and why it should matter to them and what they should be doing about it. You turn that into a really quick, succinct why, and that's a great example of how this should work and how this does work. Um, so here's what I recommend for this. There's no shortcut to finding your why. Get a piece of paper and a pen or a tablet or a laptop or post-its in a wall or a whiteboard or anything else and try to write it down. It is not a speedy exercise, nor should it be, but your business and your startup or your scale-up needs its why. And you can start to ask questions like, why was it started? Why did you go into business for yourself? The answer here should not be to make money, although I realize we all want to do that, but it should uh, be much more grounded in why you went into that particular business, what you saw as a particular opportunity or a particular example of how to do that. What would your best customers say is the real value of the benefit you provide to them? That's question number two. If you can answer both of those questions honestly and succinctly, you can probably pull your why out of those together. So Disney would say that their actual why is to create happiness in others. And you can see why that matters both to people working there and why that matters to their customers as well. Nike's is unite the world through sport. That's pretty clear too. Crayola's is really simple and I love it. It's fostering creativity in children. What I love about that one, and we're going to talk about sacrifice in just a couple of seconds, but what I love about that one is, of course, there's adults who use Crayola products but they recognize that their actual market is children and there are smart marketers who work at Crayola who figured out that the smart thing to do for their brand was not to try to make it all encompassing and say, oh, it's fostering creativity in everyone because we all know that parents will sit down with their kids and do some drawing. Yeah, but we actually are kind of being childlike when we do it. So they got very precise, which I love. Doves is help women develop a positive relationship with the way that they look. And that is actually an extraordinarily uh, developed brand purpose 
for anyone in the um, in the health and beauty area. Dove groundbreakingly did this about 15 years ago, and that's why their campaign for real beauty was so successful. And TD, for instance, theirs is to enrich lives, which is a very good word for them to have used because it allows them to talk about literally enriching by the creation of more wealth. So people come to TD for their investments. They come so they can buy a house and eventually pay off their mortgage. But also it's why they have their ready commitment and all their community initiatives because enriching lives is built into that brand. So to find your why, create and write down your own brand purpose statement and use that as a guide for all of your branding activities. And again, go back to why do you and your employees show up there every day? What is that big thing that drives you as to why you're doing it? And on your best day, what will your customers, your best customers say is the biggest benefit you're providing to them? If you can write those two things down, you can probably generate a pretty good why statement for yourself. But as I mentioned with Crayola, it is important to sacrifice. This is one of the great maxims of marketing, that positioning necessitates sacrifice. And this is a 50-year-old book called Positioning. It's by Al Rees and Jack Trout. And they will say that this is one of the critical rules in building a brand. You've got to stand for something, and that means choosing not to stand for a whole bunch of other things. Crayola would lose all of the really motivating and wonderful childlike whimsy that they build into all of the marketing that they do if they had fostering creativity in everyone as a brand purpose. But because they've decided to focus on kids, and that's what they build their brand around, it makes them obviously the number one brand for crayons and markers and coloring implements for kids, period, but also probably the number one for adults as well, because it's when adults are engaging with that category, they're being fundamentally childlike. Positioning necessitates sacrifice. And I find that smaller businesses, startups and scale-ups especially, can be at a really significant risk. The stakes are often so high that you think to yourself, well, we should just be standing for everything and our customer uh, base should be everyone and we should do as much as we possibly can. That may be good for temporary growth, but it will fundamentally mean that your brand doesn't stand for anything. And that makes it harder to lock onto a position in the minds of your customers, both current and potential, and also makes it significantly easier for clients to, uh, for um, competition to take your customers away from you. Ed Brost, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Ed, said, could your why evolve over time? E.g. Bill Gates' why may have been different when Microsoft was young, but might now be more altruistic. Absolutely. And Nike's why evolving over time is a very good example. I mean, they walked away from having as their pure kind of singular guiding mission statement, innovation and inspiration for every athlete, and they brought in uniting the world through sport. And I believe they did that for a couple of reasons, but one of them is when Nike started, they could say, we want to provide innovation and inspiration for every athlete, which has a sort of worldwide mandate, but that's very different as being a global brand. You're able to say, we are about uniting the world through sport. That has a more active worldwide role for Nike, and they grew to be big enough that they could actually do it. So that's reason number one. And reason number two is, I think that over the course of their 50 years, they viewed properly that sport is one of the things that unites our world. And I think they've also felt that in some ways, we're more outwardly divided than ever before. And so um, you'll notice that even when they're marketing solo sport uh, equipment, they actually find a way to bring unity and community more so than ever before. They don't actually tend to focus on a single jogger jogging. And you know, you get up at 6 a.m. every day and you go and do that and it rains, sleeps, nor shine, it's you. They no longer really focus on that. And they'll actually show that person being part of a group of joggers or a community of joggers. They've decided to sponsor way more group activities like Nike 10Ks and runs, again, for those individual athletes, but they recognize they need that sense of community and that sense of unification. So you absolutely can evolve your why over time. What I would say, though, is don't build a why that you're expecting to evolve. Build a why that is really great for your business and that feels evergreen and forward-looking. And if you get so successful that at the point it, it can be evolved, you will do so. But don't start building a why that needs to be evolved. Instead, think about building a great why, a distinct why, a differentiated why for your business. And that evolution, if necessary, will come down the road. Build the why for now and forever. Evolve it as needs. And I would just say here again, don't try to build a brand that does everything that your competition does. Focus on the thing that you do best that matters the most. 
There are two enormous purveyors of coffee in Canada. I mean, there's more than that, but there's two big ones that we can think of as being real coffee-driven uh, 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 brands and retail brands, restaurant brands, and that would be Starbucks as one of them. And Starbucks says that their big why is moments of connection. So you'll notice that the title of their why is just moments of connection. It doesn't even mention coffee yet until you get into the fine print, which says, we believe a shared moment of genuine connection over coffee is a simple act that helps provide an uplifting part of someone's day. Getting that moment right every time, every cup, everywhere we are, creates a brighter outlook for customers, for ourselves, and for our world. But look at the way that notion of connection bleeds into everything that Starbucks does. Right, so famously, Howard Schultz, who founded Starbucks, or one of the founders of Starbucks, talked about the third place, which may seem like a long time ago that we were actually going to coffee houses and, and for them to provide a, a third place. But he was noticing that Americans were spending less time in places like bowling alleys and clubs and that kind of thing. And he recognized there needed to be a third place. So Starbucks actually built their brand purpose into a real investment in store design. They wanted it to be a place that you wanted to stay. They do things like community bulletin boards, which seems really old school, but is really wonderful and really delightful because it's about moments of connection. They use their app to bring you back into the store, again, for moments of connection around that ritual of coffee, not just around getting something, the, the liquid itself. It's always around something bigger than that. They hire and manage their entire staff to be as outgoing and as engaging as they possibly can to have conversations with their customers. They put your name on the cup, even when they get it wrong. And here's some examples from a Starbucks Fails website where someone whose name was Andy was Auntie, um, that was Marla, who's Barbara. Uh, 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 sorry, Barbara was Marla. Uh, there's um, Bianca, who was Bianca. Um, uh, there's uh, Chad, uh, who was Chat. Uh, and I can't actually even read that. I think it says Bacharda, who was Patricia. You can find these online everywhere where people love to post when Starbucks gets their name wrong. But I would actually argue that this is another good example of a kind of moment of connection because we've all had our name in this spelled or misspoken or mispronounced by people. We don't really care about it. And it's an element of comedy. And that not taking yourself too seriously about it brings that moment of connection. They will even make products that are much more designed for being shared over Instagram than they are actually for being consumed. I don't know if you've ever had the unicorn frappuccino. Not a big fan myself because I don't think anyone needs their uh, monthly allotment of sugar in a single beverage. But it wasn't really designed with an effort to make sure that it was the best tasting thing in the world. It was really designed for a younger consumer who likes to create moments of connection and share things that look cool. And that's that unicorn frappuccino. Now compare that to Tim Hortons. Again, a very successful brand. Usually, in fact, you'll find that in almost any category, there will be multiple successful brands. And what they've all done is defined a very specific why that actually allows them to be distinct and differentiated from the competition. Tim's why is about fueling us for the joys and jobs of living in Canada. It's something about fueling Canadians for life in Canada uh, uh, at the core of what they do. Where Starbucks is about the moment of connection, they put your name on the cup. Where Tim's is about fueling you for your day, they put the contents of the cup on the cup. Right? Starbucks writes your name, Tim's puts medium double-double. Again, there's room for both of these brands to do really well if they have a distinct and differentiated why that works for themselves. I would argue that both Tim's and Starbucks, when they start to lose their why, is when they start to lose their way. So for sacrifice, focus that brand purpose on something specific and clear. Don't do everything. Do a great job of standing for one thing. And remember, there's rooms for lots of winners, whether the brands are big or small. What winning brands have in common is that they pick one thing and they own it. So number three is distinct, not different. That one thing you want to put at the center of your brand does not have to be something unique to you. Think distinct, not different. The last thing to think about as you build your brand purpose is that the why uh, um, is uh, that the one thing that you stand for doesn't have to be unique to you. You don't have to be different. You have to be distinct. Different just means two things that aren't the same. Distinct means a quality that you own that you want to highlight. 
unless you have a product or a service or a feature that your competition will never be able to reproduce, and that also matters to your customers above all else, you can put what you want to make distinct about your brand front and center, the distinct benefit to the customer that you want to focus on and own as yours. It is almost always better than building a brand around a service or a feature or a functionality that you offer right now, which isn't to say you wouldn't message about that feature or that functionality, but you would wrap it up as a distinct piece of branding as opposed to a widget that we have. I want to show you what I mean with, and I'll actually use Nike as an example for this. But actually, the examples that I'm seeing a lot of these days, to be honest, are food delivery brands. So your Uber Eats and your DoorDash uh, and your Fedoras of the world. I guess Fedora's not uh, so much around anymore. Um, but those, and then obviously, um, one of my favorites, which is Skip the Dishes. If you look at when these started, Uber Eats was really the first one that I think most people globbed onto. And initially, their whole positioning was about, we are delivering food to you using the gig economy and the fleet of people who are out there. Ultimately, that wasn't ownable by them. They built their brand position around a functional piece of technology that was far too easily for the competition to duplicate. And so now, when you think about food delivery brands, I tend to always think of Skip because they're the ones that have actually gone out and chosen to sort of put their brand on something distinct to them. They have a real position in the market. They've actually spent a bunch of money on bringing John Hamm in, and they've really focused on getting that to you in your home and actually make a lot of their marketing home-based as opposed to showing all the restaurants out in the world. They make sure to focus on you, the customer, and really own that and own that through that John Hamm thing. That's what I mean by you want to be distinct and own that piece of distinction. Nike and Reebok are really good examples. Both were shoe brands in the 1980s that offered different technology. But to consumers, I would argue it was still just shoes filled with air. Reebok had the pump. Nike had the Air Max. You'll notice that Nike chose to own excellence through innovation and inspiration with things like gravity will never be the same. Right? They actually focused on how awesome you would be at what you are doing as opposed to just talking about the technology. They built a distinct brand positioning, which was innovation and inspiration. Reebok just said, pump it up, which again, may focus more on the ownable technology that they have, but not on a distinct positioning that roots it in why it matters to its customers. Same thing happened with running ads, where Nike would actually show all of their uh, athletic shoes and just go smoke them, whereas Reebok would talk at length about this may be the only place in the club where these shoes won't perform and would talk about the technology and the shoes itself. Nike understood that the distinct brand positioning was why this matters to someone who's going to buy these shoes is because they are going to be inspired and they're going to believe that they will excel in the athletic field of their choosing. Reebok instead wanted to talk about here's what our souls are made of. So distinct, not different. How you choose to talk about the thing, how you talk about the thing you choose as a point of distinction matters more to your brand than a functional difference you own. And I would give one caveat to that. If you have invented something that no one else can possibly do or will be doing, you can in fact build a brand around that. But I would argue that that is really dangerous territory to be in. I wouldn't say that your business shouldn't be built around that, but you've got to be very sure if your brand is fundamentally, we're the only ones who do this, that you're going to be the only ones who do that. Instead, you may want to distinctly talk about the thing that you do well in a way that no one else is talking about it. Number four is use the right tools. And so we all work differently, so your mileage may vary with this. But in my experience, good branding starts with more than a keyboard or even a piece of paper or pen. This is actually the window in my house. And this is a brand that I built with Post-it notes and colors and different colors of markers to use on them. I needed a bunch of complex thoughts. So I had to be able to take something off the wall and put it back elsewhere. But this is an actual brand that I built using Post-it notes. And that's how I had to get all of my thoughts organized. You're going to be articulating Lots of different thoughts as you work on your brand and your business. You want to bring some ideas together. You want to kill others. You want to move them around. I would say whatever tools you're using to start thinking about 
why you show up at work every day, why your employees show up at work every day, and also what, what the benefits are to your customers on your very best day, I would say make sure you can capture everything and make sure you can organize, synthesize, sacrifice, write. You don't, in my experience, want just a single piece of paper and a pen and to be writing out things. You want to be able to actually organize complex thoughts. You can do that online with technology. You can do that in an analog fashion if you want to. And the other most important tool is research. And this is where smaller businesses and personal brands are often at a loss and have a lot in common. Research can be really expensive and unwieldy. But what you do have access to are people in your circle. That's clients if you've got a going concern or the people in your life if you're starting a personal business or you're actually just at that real beginning startup area and you're not scaling up fully yet into that next level. So conduct stakeholder interviews or surveys with your clients, focusing on your positive attributes and successes only in this case. This isn't the kind of customer research you do about what should we be doing to get better. Find out what it is people love about you and that brought them to engage with your business in the first place and has them re-engage with your business because that's something to build into your brand purpose. And then if you've got, keep on doing that other research, by the way, to find out what isn't working, but the stuff that isn't working isn't what makes it into your brand, right? Uh, and then um, if you can, um, if you've got data, if that's available to you, dig into that. And if you've got numbers, they may tell you something about your brand. If you are just starting your business and it's based around you as a purpose, as a person, you can conduct an, uh, uh, a, a kind of activity called a strength bombardment in which you actually get the people around you to talk about what your strengths are or what your very early business's strengths are in a way that is actually very empowering. And so just if you Google that term strength bombardment, you'll find examples of it. But essentially, you actually want to get people um, who uh, have great things to say about you and the business that has just started and ask them to pick the one thing that they like the best about it. And maybe about you, it may be about the business. Those things can actually be the foundation for a very good brand purpose for brands that are just, just, just starting. Next up after that is a brand identity and a brand book. Every business needs that brand purpose translated into a brand identity and that brand identity codified into a brand Bible or brand playbook or brand book. At a minimum, this will be a logo and a word mark as well as general look and feel guidelines. It also should include any other branded collateral materials and should get into things like tone of voice, website guidelines, social media presence. It may even include sample advertising and marketing materials. Every great brand does this. That's actually the cover page for Starbucks's global brand book. And I realize also we live in a kind of golden age of marketing and branding where we've all done some kind of education around it. You might have done as much as a semester in high school. You may have actually gone to school for more of this. Or you just may be someone who engages with the world at large and sees brands and branding every day. Everyone thinks they can do this. It's actually way harder than it looks and not everyone can do it. And even experts sometimes get it wrong. On the very left-hand side there, that's the New South Wales government who built a brand for themselves and a logo that says NSW government, which stands you know, for not safe for work. In the middle there is London 2012, the logo for the London Olympic Games, which was a good example of a badly developed logo. It was supposed to, I think, vaguely say 2012 there, and I think that's supposed to be a girl at a computer on the right-hand side, but it was just a garbled mess to some people. Others thought it looked like two members of the Simpsons family kissing each other. Gap tried to reinvent their brand 10 years ago and had to turn it right around when they went from that iconic Gap logo to something that looked like anybody could have done it. And even Tropicana switched from the brand on the left to the brand on the right in their actual packaging and had to turn that around very quickly because it was a failure. Now look, I'm not saying then don't go to experts. I'm saying that I could provide far more examples of this. Oh, and sorry, in the middle there um, is a group called Kids Exchange that didn't think about how when you put an S and an EX together, it actually spells the word sex. So they get mocked uh, um, an awful lot for having the word sex in there in the in the in the in the title of the brand. Um, uh, and I don't want to actually be making uh, my my goal isn't to make fun of them or this or any business at, at all. I could actually show way more examples here of smaller businesses that have done far, far, far worse, but I get how difficult it is and I don't actually wanna pick on those smaller brands, so I've picked large ones in particular. It's not just a, about avoiding these big errors though. It's about making sure that your brand, the name, the logo, and the marketing are all helping to build your business. And if the experts can get it wrong, it means the amateurs at it can get it even more so. 
So at some point you have to invest in building your brand. And this usually means engaging a branding or marketing firm, or at least a person to do it. And I realize I'm someone who works at a marketing agency saying that, but my honest experience is at some point you're going to have to outsource this and you should be going to experts who know how to do this. I would say pick a channel or two, especially if you're just starting and especially if you're handling marketing yourselves, don't feel you have to be on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook ads, on television, print, radio, everything, TikTok, all of it. Just pick one or two to start. Just like you need to focus on one thing to stand for, you also need to prioritize a media channel or two to speak in. So if you have a particularly youthful target consumer, you might want to be on TikTok. If you're B2B, you might want to be on LinkedIn, but don't feel that you have to be everywhere. Instead, excel in a couple of channels. But do make sure you Google My Business, Your Business. This is probably um, self-evident for a lot of people out there, and it may matter more for some of you than others, but most of you have probably already done this. But make sure you've actually created your free business profile on Google because SEM and SEO matter. Search is critical, and it starts with Google. So make sure your business is clearly available there because of how much search matters. But more than anything, remember the whys, why you matter to you and why you matter to your customers. There are lots of great brands out there. And the next... Let's just say one, sorry, the next one is yours. But build it and scale it because your business depends on it. And that is fundamentally up to you. Great brands tend to be built by people who are committed and invested and interested in their business, and they tend to need help to get them there. So to everyone out there right now who feels like their business is on the cusp of getting bigger, I would say it absolutely is. And the thing that's going to make it get bigger is a really great brand. That's it for me. We have time for some questions if you'd like. Fantastic, Max. Well, thanks so much for that. Um, super engaging. Learn a lot around not just uh, organizational company brands, but also personal brands. So are there any uh, questions from the floor? Please do feel um, free to submit them. Um, we do have a couple of minutes left. I do see one from Flan. Um, Max, you might like to answer which is tips on developing brand as a media company with two markets and sponsors. So how would you uh, approach that? Yeah, so you absolutely want to find an intersection for your why that is both your audience and sponsors. And you're going to um, communicate that why in different ways to those two audiences for sure. But that's a communication strategy, and that can often be a media strategy, and that's a comm strategy. That's not the same as a pure branding strategy where you want the why to be applicable to both of your audiences. It's critical because, in fact, your audience uh, may be your, uh, as a media company, maybe your audience, but those people may also be your sponsors and vice versa, right? You're going to have people that are members of both of those audiences. Uh, but regardless, it is critical that the why for a single business is applicable to both those audiences. Don't try to build two whys. Instead, a single why that then gets communicated purposefully. And I just, we had another question, uh, uh, sorry, communicated purposefully to those two audiences. We did have someone who just mentioned that NSW stands for New South Wales. I get that. What I wanted to point out is it also stands for not safe for work. And so I probably wouldn't be going out with a logo front and center that communicates something different than what that does. Fantastic, Max. Well, we've run out of time today. So uh, just wanted to say a huge thank you for sharing all of that knowledge with us. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us have found that uh, supremely helpful on the call today of just building our brands, reviewing that work and progress that we've done. Um, so thanks, uh, virtual high five, Max. And yeah, you've joined today the um, the Growth and Resiliency Speaker Series. This was the final uh, speaker in this particular series. Um, we are super excited to have partnered with the Mount Royal University and Growth Catalyst Program, as well as Alberta Innovates, the province's innovation engine. Um, so do watch this space for future events. Obviously, this will be posted on the um, Unbound um, platform and also YouTube. So there'll be various ways that you can catch this. You can share it with the rest of your audience and others that may be interested in seeing this. So thanks a lot, everybody. And um, we'll see you again, hopefully soon.